one, one, two, two. Okay, this is really exciting because getting the permit to film here was something that I wasn't sure that I would get, but I did. So, shalom everyone. Welcome to another vlog by Danny the Digger. And this time, completing the series of following Jesus in Jerusalem, this is a side story that is very little known, but still very interesting one. I am at the entrance to Yera Moni Timoi Stavro, the holy site of the sacred cross. The sacred cross. What's it got to do to a monastery on the western side of Jerusalem? Well, again, I got the permit to film here inside. The door was pre-arranged to be open. Otherwise, just look at this actually. Look what a heavy medieval locking system you have here. And I am uh, in Western Jerusalem, far away from the old city. I'm in a place that it's today next to the Parliament Building and the Israel Museum, uh, next to Katamon. Hello, kitty. <laughs> hey, sweetie. Are you Greek? <laughs> And yes, I am in a Greek Orthodox monastery that is maintained by one woman which doesn't speak even Greek. I don't even know what language she speaks, but we did have an understanding that I can film here. And I'm very happy to achieve this and share with you. Again, this little known site, but still significant and, and sacred, at least for the Eastern churches, because it relates to an interesting topic, which is the origin of the cross. The cross used for the crucifixion of Jesus, where did it come from? So this monastery claims to be at the very spot where it came from, and there's a very interesting story relating to it, which you can see here through this painting. Okay, the painting is showing Lot watering a tree that is a combination of three types of trees. You have uh, cedar, you have cypress, and you have olive here. Okay, a combination that doesn't really work in nature, but hey, we're talking about a holy site and a tradition, and these things can happen in traditions. Here's the nakos, both the wooden and the metal rod that is used to call for prayer in the Greek Orthodox. This is the parallel to the Catholic uh, bells on, on towers. And by the way, I want to say thank you to Katerina, <laughs> who's a, a, a Greek uh, member of the old city's uh, community, and she helped me a lot in getting arrangements to film here and uh, to, to be continued. We're also working on getting permits to film in other places. But let's take now a look inside. Okay, this rather large and impressive and almost abandoned church used to house, believe it or not, some 800 monks in its peak. And its beginnings is not really Greeks. The, uh, the, the local tradition says that this place was spotted by Helena, the famous Helena, mother of Constantine, and been venerated ever since. Justinian enlarged the place, and then uh, when the Muslims took over the Holy Land, at some point even the treasures of the Nia Church in Jerusalem were kept here, which by local tradition included even the temple treasures. So that's a very interesting subject by itself, which I plan to cover as well, the Nia Church and the traditions around it. And uh, yet later the Muslims looking for those treasures came and uh, butchered, uh, killed all the monks of this place. This is the local tradition. Historically, we know of sources beginning in the 11th century of a Georgian monk, not a Greek one, but a Georgian, which also explains this language over here, who settled here and started developing the tradition that this is the place that relates to where the cross came from. But the site became really famous for the Gorgian, for a specific person that settled here, named Sota Hotashvili. I hope I'm spelling his name properly. 
Here is actually an image that survived from that time that the Georgians controlled this place. And he's a very, very famous poet. He's almost like Homerus or, I don't know, any you know, national poet of America. Uh, he wrote uh, important and famous poems for the Georgians. The most famous one is The Men Wearing the Panther's Skin. <laughs> Sounds familiar, maybe not as famous as the Iliad or biblical stories, but by Georgian uh, culture, it's a very famous story of an impossible love affair between uh, 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 an officer in the army of the Georgian kingdom falling in love with the princess and the pain that the, he and his beloved go through, but like any good story, it has an happy ending and they uh, fulfill their love. Anyway, this is the place where he personally lived, which makes it very important for the Georgians, but the Georgians aren't here anymore. The reason is because in the Ottoman times, the Georgians went into dire straits financially, and eventually they just gave it to the Greek uh, Orthodox Church, which was doing apparently better financially, and they are in charge of this place to this day. That explains why you have here a very interesting and kind of unusual combination of both Georgian and Greek. You can see it best here. You can see both languages, both the Greek and the Georgian. Now, the Greeks also at the peak had here hundreds of monks, but uh, monasticism isn't as attractive as it used to be. And eventually, even the Greeks closed the place in the early 20th century. But after the, the war of 1948, it was reopened again. And then in the 1970s, the Greeks sent here a very interesting character, which I knew personally, a man called Vasilius Tsafiris. He came from a poor family in Samos, and his family destined him to be a monk, and he was eventually placed here. But he didn't like the concept. He didn't like the idea that you have to be celibate. He liked women, and he liked to have access to more knowledge than just religious texts. And he eventually, believe it or not, signed up at the Hebrew University to study archaeology. He be actually became a famous archaeologist of the Israel Antiquities Authority, conducted some important excavations in Capernaum and cool sea sites that I'm going to review when I head to uh, the north. And I once actually guided a, a mission, uh, a Hebrew University delegation here, and he was the guest honor, and he showed them around, and I got to meet him, which was shortly before he passed away. So I, I even have a, a photo of him here uh, on my website. Anyway, this is just a personal connection for me, but what makes this site so important for anyone following the series of following Jesus in Jerusalem, the sanctity is here in the back. Okay, I may have to use my torch. It gets pretty dark here, but quite interesting. Okay, here we go. These are garments of the clergy that used to operate this monastery in the past. Last time I came here a few years ago, there were four monks operating the place. Today, it seems like there's just one, one nun uh, that doesn't even speak English or Greek and definitely not Hebrew. Um, but Katerina told me that sometimes uh, pilgrims would spend the night here. They still have some operation for... Uh, at least Greek visitors. But here is the interesting part from a Christian and traditional Christian point of view. Wait, I think this might would be better. Here we go. So the story begins with Abraham visited by three angels about to tell him that his dear wife is going to become pregnant. This is a famous story that didn't happen here, it doesn't relate to the site, except for the fact that you see that they're holding three staffs. They gave it to him as a gift. And at some point later, his cousin Lot is told to leave Sodom because the city is full of sinners, and he does so. His wife, his disobedient wife, looks back and becomes a pillar of salt. But he does escape with his daughters, and then they get him drunk, and they sleep with him. He performs a horrible sin, 
And Abram convinces him that the only way to redeem is to take the three sticks given by the angels and plant them, water them with water from the Jordan River, and if it succeeds, he will be forgiven. And so he does too, but of course any story has challenges. In this case, the Satan tempts him in different ways, which, like the story with Jesus later, he will resist those temptations, plant those trees. As you can see, they're combined of cedar, cypress, and olive, water them properly, and a beautiful tree will grow. A beautiful, unique tree will grow. Tradition says that in the days of King Solomon, they tried chopping the tree for Solomon's temple, but it, they wouldn't succeed. When will they finally tear it down in the first century to make the beams for the crucifixion of Jesus? Okay, so here is the story completed, narrated, and here is its final destiny to be used for the crucifixion of Jesus. And if I haven't reviewed yet the stories of the fragments of that cross and their faith and the stories around them, I shall do this too. But why am I telling you all of this story right here? Because the claim is, this is the very spot. This is where you can leave a donation and this is where you could put your hand and touch the place with the tree from which the cross came from. Okay? It's not a very famous tradition or location, but it is a great story, you have to admit. So I hope you've all enjoyed this little side story of the Monastery of the Cross. The site uh, is not really regularly open, but uh, there is a phone and you can always knock on the door and try your chance in seeing this hidden and charming place. What a beautiful medieval design we have here. Okay, so I hope you've all enjoyed this presentation. I'm about to complete the series, as I said, and finally head up north. Uh, as usual, if you like it, please hit subscribe and like. And if you really, really want to help, I would so appreciate a little financial contribution as this has been all done on a very, very low budget. Actually, no budget. I'm spending money on this. So thank you all uh, for contributions through PayPal. Very easily you can do so through the link in the description and in the first comment below. And until my next chapter, so long from Jerusalem.